give God a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. At this time, we're going to have our statement of faith. And I'm going to read the leader's portion of it. And you're going to read the people's portion. Amen. Would you please stand to your feet as we read the statement of faith. Amen. Our belief concerning the Bible. We believe the Bible to be the inspired and only infallible written word of God. Amen. Let's do that again so we can read together. Amen. Our belief concerning the Bible. We believe the Bible to be the inspired and only infallible written word of God. Our belief concerning God. We believe that there is only one God eternally existed in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Our belief concerning the church. We believe in the blessed hope, which is the rapture of the church of God, which is in Christ at his return. Our belief concerning sin. We believe that the only means of being cleansed from sin is through repentance and faith in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Our belief concerning salvation. We believe that regeneration by the Holy Ghost is absolutely essential for personal salvation. Our belief concerning Christ. We believe that the redemptive work of Christ on the cross provides healing for the human body in answer to believing prayer. Amen. Somebody give God a hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen. We will now have our invocation. Father Yahweh, our Elohim, we come to you this morning in the name of Yahshua, our Hamashiach. Father, we want to thank you just for being so good to us. Thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you for the multitudes of thy tender mercy. Father, we could have been dead and gone as a And let our bleed moments roll on just a little while longer. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for food to eat. Thank you for clothes to wear. Thank you for the roof over our head. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the loved ones near and far. And our Father, we ask now in the name of Jesus that you will hide us under the blood, that you will hold us in your hand. never before in a wicked land that we're living in we need you oh God we need you to comfort the feeble heart we need you to encourage the downtrodden mind we need you to have mercy on the bereaved oh the father our God the power 
paradise of praises. Look on us. Look on us right now. We need you, oh God, as an empty picture before a poor fountain. Father, we need you. And we're asking you right now, oh God, that you will look on this is head with wisdom and understanding. Look on each and every one. We ask, oh God, that you would hold us in the hollow of thine head. And then, Lord, when it's all over with, you know. You know all about it. You know our upright. You know our line now. You know our going and you know our coming. Hold us in your hand. That the devil may not have the preeminence in our life. Hold us in your hand, oh God. Rebuke the spirit of fear and let your joy come. These blessings. Oh God, we pray in the name of Jesus. Thank God.
I'm here to speak. I'm here to talk about what well, I thought. I'm here to say our, um, our scripture. <laughs> it's coming from Leviticus chapter 20, verse 7 and 8. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy. For I am the Lord your God, and ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctifies you. And that is the scripture for today.
give honor to God on this morning. Amen. Who is the head of my life? And I thank God because he is still God. Amen. God is still on the throne and he is yet reigning from on high. How many of you believe that on this morning? God is still in charge. Listen, before I get started with my message, could you do me a favor? I don't ask for too many things, but could you do me a favor? Could you look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I am blessed. Amen. Now, if that neighbor didn't get happy for you, maybe you chose the wrong neighbor. Do me a favor again. Find you another neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm blessed. Now, if that neighbor didn't get happy for you, it ain't the neighbor. I think it's you. Find somebody else and look at them. And put a note in your throat and say, neighbor, I said, neighbor, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. And if you don't want to give God some praise, move out of my way, because I want to give him some praise right now. Somebody ought to start waving your hand. Somebody ought to start thinking about the goodness of Jesus. Somebody ought to start thinking about what he's done for me. My soul cries out, hallelujah. I thank God for saving me. And every time I think about it, it makes me happy on the inside. I have to give all glory and praise to our Father. Let us go to God in prayer. God, we thank you. We thank you because you've been so kind. You've been so merciful. And your mercies are renewed every morning. We thank you, God, because we comfortably laid down last night and you rose us right on up this morning in our right mind, oh God, and you started us on our way. And we identify, God, that it was you who did it. That, God, we just said thank you. We said thank you, oh God. Now, God, as we stand here for this moment, oh God, of inspiration and word from you, oh God, open our hearts, God, open our minds that we may receive from you, oh God. Plant the seed of the word in our hearts and minds so we may grow therefrom, God, and live our lives better, knowing that you are our Savior and our Redeemer. Now, God, as I speak your word, Anoint these lips of clay to say what only you would say. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, we say amen, amen, and amen. God bless you on this morning. Listen, as I get into my message, let me tell each and every one of you, that I appreciate you. I thank each of you for the service that you give to this ministry. I thank you for your commitment. I thank you for your loyalty to this organization and your loyalty to God. I don't get a chance to speak to each one of you after every service, but I want you to know that coming from the pastor, coming from the official seat of the pastor, that you are appreciated and you are loved. Amen. Listen, on this morning, I want to talk about communion. I want to talk about the Lord's Supper. I want to bring our minds to the Lord's table. And if you give me just a few minutes, I want to do my best to explain the importance of it to you. Many of us have been in church for quite some time all of our lives and we've seen communion done. We've taken communion and uh, we've seen different things done when handling the Lord's table. But I remember as a little boy, they used to have some training that went into handling the Lord's table. 
And they also had instructions concerning taking communion. And I think for our importance on today that we speak about those things. Can I get an amen? You don't have to be quiet. I'm talking about something that you already know. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. And I'm going to start at the 23rd verse. And it says this, For I have received from the Lord. This is the Apostle Paul talking. For I have received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night that he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 25 says, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. This is the word of God, and not a jot nor a tittle shall pass away until all has been fulfilled. Somebody say amen. amen. On today, I'm going to just touch on a few points of communion. In our study of the scriptures, and more specifically, the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ, we find certain practices that Christ initiated or instituted for those who believe in him. Uh, these practices he instituted uh, have been called rites. They have been called rituals, or more commonly, we refer to them as ordinances of the church. Meaning that somewhere in our worship, somewhere in our worship, according to the word of God, we must adhere to these ordinances. We must designate time to observe these ordinances. And as an example, our city has ordinances. We have a city ordinance that says you cannot smoke in certain restaurants. We also have city ordinance that says you can't have loud music in certain areas. An ordinance is a piece of legislation enacted by an authority. Do you hear what I'm saying? Christ enacted some ordinance that we must observe. And if we do a study of the Holy Scripture, we find three ordinances. Three ordinances that Christ instituted for his disciples. He instituted it for his disciples then, and that's for us disciples right now. One of those ordinances is the ordinance of baptism. Have you heard it? Have you seen it? And we practice baptism by full immersion. We don't sprinkle anyone. We go by the model that's left by Christ. We are totally immersed in the water. We are totally submerged in the water. And this is symbolic. And this is what it means that when we go under the water and we come up, we rise to the death of our old life. And we rise to the resurrection of our new life. Somebody also says that baptism represents the Lord's death, his burial, and his resurrection. Today I'm not going to teach on baptism. I'm going to save that for another time. There's more things that we need to know about baptism. But for right now, Every believer 
of Jesus Christ ought to be baptized. If Jesus Christ himself got baptized, every believer need to follow in his footsteps and ought to be baptized. That's one of the ordinances of the church. And that's not a problem if you haven't been baptized. Because we can get it done, Deacon Marshall. Ain't no shame in it. I've seen preachers go back to the pool to get baptized. I've seen church mothers go to the pool to be baptized. Because they wanted to make sure that they followed all of the ordinances that Christ instituted. Another ordinance of the church is feet washing. Oh, you don't see this one too much anymore. This is when they used to bring the little basins out of the back. Take your shoes off. Take your socks off and put your feet in the water. Kneel down at your feet and wash your feet. Why would we do something like that? Christ himself did it for his disciples. And he did this to show humility. Now listen to this. Christ understood that Humility characterized greatness in the kingdom of God. Get that what I just said. Christ knew that humility characterized greatness in the kingdom of God. And services that's rendered, that's motivated by love, really exists. So Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. There's one more ordinance that I want to talk about, and it's the one that we are going to observe on today. And it's the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. Somebody said the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. Communion. Communion. This is also a symbolic ordinance. In examining the scriptures on today of the Lord's Supper, we find that there is no prescribed frequency on doing the Lord's Supper. Now, I see the looks on your face, but listen to me. In Scripture, there is no prescribed frequency. Some churches do it on the first Sunday, and that's all right. Some churches do it on the second Sunday, and that's fine. Some churches do it quarterly. That's okay. Some churches do it every Sunday when they meet, and that's fine because they do it, Deacon Marshall. The scripture does not give a prescribed frequency. It just says as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. But there is something vitally important that I need you to know on today concerning the Lord's Supper. And it is this. Communion is not an axiom to salvation. Let me say it another way. There is no salvation in taking the communion. Listen to what I'm saying. You can't get saved simply from taking communion. There's a lot of different thoughts out there, and there's some other reformations that practice certain things. But if it can't be backed up with Scripture... It's not being practiced the right way. You cannot be saved from taking communion. You can only be saved by faith in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Are you with me? The same goes for feet washing and the same goes for baptism. There is no salvation in the ordinances. Do you hear what I'm saying on today? The only way to receive salvation is through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. These ordinances will not save you. They're symbolic, which means this. There is a meaning behind the ordinances. But you have to grasp what's going on behind the ordinances because the act itself cannot save you. There's a meaning behind the ordinances. I just explained one of them to you with baptism. 
There's a meaning behind the ordinance. And because it is scripture, it is binding, legally binding, on each and every one of us. Well, what do the Lord's Supper symbolize? What does it symbolize? And what is it saying to us on this morning? Well, first of all, it is a time of commemoration. Somebody say commemoration. And commemoration defined means to recall and show respect for someone in a ceremony or special service. To serve as a memorial of something. Today we commemorate Christ's suffering for our sins. On today as we approach the Lord's table, we remember Christ's suffering for our sins. And brothers and sisters, if you remember, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus Christ suffered. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he suffered at the hands of God. If you remember the scriptures in the Garden of Gethsemane, it says this. Jesus in the Garden fell down on his face and bowed down to God and said these words while he was in immeasurable anguish. He said this, the same Jesus that came down from heaven took off all of glory, put on flesh, walked amongst us, found himself in the garden, and this is what he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Let me try to make it a little clearer for you. If you study the scriptures, it says this, before the foundations of the world was laid, the lamb, which is Jesus Christ, was already slain. Before the world was made, the decision had already been made for Christ to come and suffer and go to the cross. Do you follow me? The decision had already been made, but the time had come, the hour had come. We can plan to do some things, but when the time comes, you got to face it. Jesus Christ himself, in the flesh, already made the decision what he was going to do. Now he was at that moment. And when God put the sins of every individual on him. Let me say it like this. I've done enough sinning in my life that could have killed Christ himself. All it took was one sin. Just one sin. And I'm quite sure you have done some sinning in your life too. God took all of our sins, everybody that ever lived, everybody who's going to live, and placed it right on Jesus Christ in that garden. And the scripture told us that Jesus cried out to his father, Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. It was more than he could bear. But he said this, yet I want your will to be done. Not my will, God. Not 
Tim Littleton's will. Not anyone's will in here. God let your will be done. Jesus Christ suffered at the hands of God in Gethsemane. And family, Jesus Christ suffered at the hands of Satan. He did a lot of suffering. If you remember when he was fasting, the book of Luke tells you he was fasting, the Holy Spirit took him out to the wilderness to be tempted. And while he was out there, Satan tried him. Satan tempted the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was trying to get Jesus to circumvent the cross. He was trying to get Jesus to take an unapproved method to get things done. But in doing that, Jesus would have missed the cross. Therefore, we wouldn't have forgiveness for our sins. But Jesus got Satan straight. He knew he had to go to the cross. And Jesus suffered at the hands of men. At Golgotha, Golgotha, didn't he? He suffered at the hands of men. They spit on him. They grabbed hands full of hair. And tore his beard out. Snatch out of his head. They struck him and they punched him. And I don't know about you, but I I believe that there were some fellas in there really swinging. They weren't tapping Jesus Christ. Deacon Marshall, they were throwing haymakers. Trying to kill him in. Are you with me? They whipped him all night long. I couldn't take a whooping for 10 seconds. They whooped Jesus Christ all night long. They scourged him. They beat him with whips that had metal tips in it. So every time they hit him and pulled back, it snatched the flesh off of his body. All of that, the scripture says, was for me. The scripture said he went through all of that for you. Do you believe that? Today as we take the bread and we drink of the fruit of the vine, before you put it in your mouth, remember that he did it for me. Remember that he did it for me. And Deacon Father, uh, uh, he didn't have to do it. He didn't have to do it. Because I was guilty of my own sins. He didn't have to do it. Because every one of my sins that I committed, I was guilty of. And every sin, every single sin, the Bible says carries a penalty. Every sin carries a penalty. The scripture says the wages of sin is death. In the mind of God, all pure, all holy, Sin can't get near him. And his penalty for sin is death. Every time we go to the Lord's table, it ought to remind us of these things that I'm speaking about. Every time we go to the Lord's table, it ought to remind us of the majesty of his grace. And the magnitude of our guilt. The reason why some people don't value what Christ did on the cross 
It's because they fail to realize the magnitude of their guilt. My God. If you realize how guilty you really are, that's the only way you can truly understand what Christ did on the cross. My brothers and sisters, we can't really shout about grace until we understand how guilty we are. Let me say it again. You can't truly shout about the grace of God until you realize how guilty you really are. Somebody ought to help me preach this morning. If God's death through Jesus Christ means something to you, you ought not have a lackadaisical approach to it. If God's death through Jesus Christ means anything to you, and what he did on the cross to purchase your salvation with his own blood every time we come to worship. Every time we come before the Lord's table, we ought to give it everything we got. I heard some wise person say, salvation is free. But it sure wasn't cheap. Did you hear what I said? Salvation is free, but it sure wasn't cheap. Salvation cost God everything. Salvation cost him everything. And when we come to the Lord's house, if he gave everything, when we come to the Lord's house, we ought to give everything. The Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper is about sacrifice. It's about sacrifice. Christ came down from heaven through 42 generations, left his heavenly estate, came down here and put on flesh just like me and you have. And he surrendered his life. Yes, he That's sacrifice. Yes, people of God, I hear oftentimes uh, some people ask me when I invite them to church, uh, when I invite them to come over in fellowship with us, you hear them sometimes, they say, well, what can the church do for me? That's what they'll say. What can the church do for me? They'll say, do you have a daycare, a nursery? Do you have a media center? Do you have all of these amenities? And I kindly try to tell them that we're building. And as God see fit, he's going to give us those things. But having the position of what can the church do for me is the wrong position in my mind. Because this is the thing about sacrifice. Church has an element of sacrifice because Jesus Christ sacrificed. Well, brother preacher, how do we sacrifice? I'll tell you how we sacrifice. You give of your time. That is a sacrifice. You could be doing all kinds of other things, and I do understand that. But that's sacrifice to the ministry. You give up your money. You give up your resources. You give up your equipment. You sacrifice for the church. And that's fine because Christ gave his life for the church. So it shouldn't bother us for our small sacrifices. Are you with me on today? There's an element of sacrifice in the Lord's table. The people of God, most of all, in the Lord's table, there is an element 
of celebration. Look at your neighbor and say celebration. Celebration, celebration means to make a special occasion. Uh, the Latin translation means a feast. And when we come to the Lord's table, it is a feast. And it's a feast that we celebrate God's compassion towards us. Do I have a believer in the house? We were like sheep without a shepherd. But God had compassion on us. Think about all the sins that you've done. Think about all the sins that you've already committed. And God let you live. God let you wake up this morning and come to the house of God with all of our mess, our faults. He allowed us to make our way here knowing that he could have cut us off. But yet he's still blessing you with a job. Yet he's still blessing you with a warm place to sleep on tonight. You still got a reasonable portion of your health. You got food on your table. Everything that you need, need, God has already provided for you. Not because you deserve it, Deacon Fowler. Not because we deserve it, but because of who he is. Somebody say it's because of who he is. Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, that is the difference between folks that know the difference between mercy and grace and those that think they got it all together. Mercy is God holding back from us what we deserve. Let me say it again. Mercy is God holding back from us what we deserve. And grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Did you hear what I said? We don't deserve to be in this house this morning. But God has been so faithful. God has been so faithful. We don't deserve to be here. Ain't nothing you did validated you being alive right now. It's because of God's grace and his mercy that we are here today guess what else he took our sins away he carried our grief away the scripture said he bore our grief he cries when we cry he rejoices when we rejoice and when we come into God's presence Every time we come into God's presence, I don't ever get tired of telling God thank you. I can't get tired of telling God thank you because of what he's done for this old fella here. Now let me tell you this before I hurry to my seat. You ought to have a real reason to praise the Lord. You ought to have a real reason to praise the Lord. When you think about it, you ought to have a real reason. Some of us was born on the wrong side of the tracks. Some of us was born and didn't have anything given to us. Some of us didn't even have a good house to live in. Some of us didn't even have more than one pair of shoes. Is that you? Listen, but right now you are here. You got up this morning. You decided what to put on before you came here. You even decided on what you were going to eat today because you have so many options. And if you don't want to eat at home, you can decide what restaurant to go to. You can jump right in that car that God has provided for you with the money that God has provided for you from the job that God has provided for you and the appetite that God put in your belly and you can go to any restaurant you want to eat at. How dare we come in the house of God and enjoy all of those blessings and don't give God no praise. Woo. That's reason to celebrate 
the Lord's table is about celebration. We close with this. We close with this. One thing that I've learned, one thing that I've learned is that we are pilgrims here. This world is not our home. You've heard many people say it before. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. We're tenants. We're tenants. And it comes a time when every tenant lease expires. The lease is going to expire for each and every one of us. But here's the thing. Along the way, in lease agreements, the building that you're residing in, this body you're residing in is going to have leaks in the pipes. It's going to suffer damage along the way. And sooner or later, that building is going to be condemned. Nobody will be able to live inside of that building anymore. But here is the good part. If you got the right lease agreement. <laughs> if you got the right lease agreement, when you are living in this body, you got a forwarding address. <laughs> if you believe in Jesus Christ, you got a forwarding address. Because I'm going to a city that's not made by hands. This soul is going to have to move. This soul is going to have to move. This soul is going to have to move. Your lease is going to expire one day. The best thing that you can do is accept Jesus Christ into your life. Yes. Yes. You've heard me say it before. Christianity is the only religion, and I've studied them, brother. It's the only religion that salvation is totally free. Who would want to serve a God like that? You also hear me say, oftentimes, if what I preach to you and what I teach to you in the Bible, if it isn't real, you have nothing to lose. But by chance, if what I preach and teach to you is real, you got everything to gain. Do you hear me? If you're in here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, you can know him. You can become his disciple and you can enjoy the fellowship, the sweet communion with him. All you have to do is repent and ask him into your heart. If you don't know how to do it, just literally repeat the words that I'm about to say. Father, in the name of Jesus, forgive me for my sins. I recognize that I am a sinner, worthy of death. But God, I am confessing with my own mouth right now that I want you to come into my heart. I believe that you are the Son of God and that you died for all of my sins. And on the third day, God, Jesus Christ was raised.
from the grave. And because he lives, I can live. If you've repeated those words after me, you have received salvation. Now all you need is a little training and instructions. That's all. To walk this journey hand in hand. Somebody give God a hand clap of praise. Christ has done so much for us. Deacon Marshall, all we have to do is just remember what he's done, brother. Remember what he's done. That's why before he left, he gave us these ordinances so we won't forget about his suffering for us. Somebody say amen. We're about to get ready to transition into our communion service. Amen. Help me sing this song real quick as we transition to our communion service.
1 Corinthians 11.23-26 For I receive the Lord, but I also deliver to you that the Lord Jesus Christ on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way also he took the cup after the supper saying this cup is a new covenant do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen.
and said, this is my body that is broken for you. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Eat ye all of it. Amen. And a little while later, while they were still at their meal, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. My blood will be shed for you. For without the shedding of blood, there will be no remission of sin. As often as you take this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death until he comes. Drink ye all of it. Amen. And according to tradition and scripture, it said they left out singing a hymn. And the one that I like to sing says, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, Jesus died upon that cross. I know it something that I haven't done in a while and normally I do it when I see some new faces uh, in the building but a young lady came to me last week and she got on me she said pastor <laughs> when you go open the doors of the church <laughs> amen amen so allow me to do that right now if there's anyone if there's anyone that want to be brought into the family of our fellowship. This is a family where love abides. This is a family where we are literally family. If there's anyone in here that wants to be a member, we stand with our arms wide open right now to receive you into the fellowship of our fellowship church. Is there anyone? 
Somebody come on, give God a hand clap of praise. This is my mama right here, y'all. <laughs> come on, darling. <laughs> Listen, Sister Thomasina has been with us since uh, Resurrection Sunday. Since Resurrection Sunday. And so she's been coming over and fellowshipping with us. And we've had so many extensive conversations, you know, talking on the phone and things like that. And I can tell you what, God is working on her even as we speak. God is healing her right now even as we speak. Amen. Amen. And so there are two different kinds, amen, of membership. Amen. One type of membership is called watch care. Watch care is when the person actually has another home church in a different location, but for the distance they can't attend. So they come to the church of their choice and they say, I need a spiritual covering while I'm away from home. And many times us as military people, we have to do that. Amen. We have to do that. Um, but for me, every time I went somewhere, I joined that church full membership. And this is the difference. Full membership, amen, is saying that you're making that your home church. Now, I got to be honest with you from, from, from pastor's standpoint. If God is feeding you somewhere, if God is blessing you somewhere, if God is providing for your needs, at a certain place. That's where you ought to plant yourself. Ain't nothing wrong with having your membership at your home church. Amen. But you should commit to that ground where God is blessing you at. Do you hear what I'm saying? I've had some people say, Pastor, I send my tithes back home to my home church. And I said, huh, I understand that. But your tears are on my desk. You counsel right here. You fellowship with the members right here. We eat together. We cry together. So if you're right here, don't be scared of committing. Do you hear what I'm saying? You need a spiritual covering. Amen. All right. All right. This is my sister Thomasina Hughley right here. And she always talked to me. She pulled me to the side. She passed I got to tell you something. And she'll tell me stuff. But she got on to me. So I'm making it right, mama. I'm making it right, okay? <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to give her a hand clap of praise as we bring her into the membership of the Howard Fellowship family. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And with that, her name will be officially put on the roll with all of ours. Amen. And so when anything happens, we're going to be here for Sister Thomasina. You hear what I said? We're going to pray for her. We're going to love her. We're going to walk this journey together. Amen. All right. Love you, Mama Thomas. Lord, she cried. It's all right, baby. It's all right to cry. Yes, Lord. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right. I've done my talking for the day. I'm going to relinquish my stand just for a moment. Amen, saints. It's offering time. I said it's offering time. How many of you know that if you give back, it will be given unto you? So we thank God for those that are joining us uh, in service via live stream. And as you prepare to give your offering, please use one of the white envelopes that are on the seats. Um, and please be sure to write all your information on it. If you need an envelope at this time, please raise your hand. One of the ushers will provide you with an envelope. For those streaming live, you can give via Cash App, dollar sign, our fellowship, or via Zelle, the number 210-842-9260. At this time, please stand and repeat after me the scripture, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7. For this I say, for this I say, he which soweth so sparingly, he which soweth sparingly, reap also sparingly, reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully, and he which soweth bountifully, 
shall reap also bountifully. Shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposed in his heart. Every man as he purposed that purpose in his heart. So let him give. So let him give. Not grudgingly. Not grudgingly. Or of necessity. Or of necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver. For God loveth a cheerful giver. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for those that are ready to give, those that have a cheerful heart. In the name of Jesus, God, you said you would press it down, shake it together, and run it over in good measure. You would give back unto us as we give unto others and to you. We thank you for this opportunity to give. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, the ushers will come around. Sunday, the following Sunday, is going to be the Christmas concert. All right, feel free to uh, dress down. We're going to sing Christmas carols and everything like that. I don't see nothing wrong with that. Amen. We're going to sing Rudolph the Red No Reindeer, so touch up on those, uh, those words, okay? Touch up on Silent Night and all of those things like that. Ain't nothing wrong with having a good time in the Lord. 
And if anybody want to talk theologically about it and tell me why it's wrong, tell them to come talk to me. I got something for them. Somebody say amen. amen. Now listen. Listen, on the 31st of December, we're going to be having a combined watch night service, all right? This is going to be the five churches that we fellowship. And we're going to be uh, meeting over at Superintendent Duckworth's church. Okay, that's Philippians. I think some of you have been there uh, with me as well. I've been asked to be the revivalist on that night. Amen. I will be speaking on that night. Amen. And I tell you, uh, uh, no preacher likes to go nowhere and they don't see their own congregation and family there. Amen. They have already told me that they're going to feed us on that night. Amen. And so if you're not doing anything other than watching the ball drop on that night, you just come on out and fellowship with us. Amen. As we give God some praise from bringing us out of the old year into the new year. Somebody say amen. 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 God bless you. We'll now have our benediction by Reverend Timothy Littleton Sr. Our master and our king, as we depart this place, but not from your service, we ask that you would watch over every soul. We ask that you would hold us in your hand and keep us until we can come back at the appointed time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.